Look at 2111. And there will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences, and there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. Jesus promised that all these things were going to happen. When you compare what it says in Revelation 6, 8, basically the world is facing inescapable death. Now, some of you uh, have already started on Revelation 6. In fact, one of you has already finished all the devotionals. This is what I wrote for my Revelation 6. Since all those people are going to die, what should I do? I wrote, our motivation should be John 3.16, that God loves the world. And the power that I feel when I share the gospel is from John 6.44. And that verse says that nobody will come to God unless he pulls on them. So my part is I'm supposed to go and share the gospel with everybody I can find. But I know that behind everything I'm doing is God who is reaching inside of them and working in their heart and convicting them. And I don't have to invent a new method because the method is in Colossians 1, which says we preach Christ warning every person. And then I like Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 5.11. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade people. Paul didn't just say, hey, if you want to get saved, you ought to think about it. Paul urged people. He said, I urge you, come to Christ. Now, there's a very interesting passage in the Bible in Luke 12, and I call it a tour of the grave. Jesus told many parables, but this is not a parable because it's the only one of Jesus' parables that he names the people that are in the story. Jesus tells us that as soon as unsaved people die, they open their eyes and they're very alive, very conscious, and in a very terrible place. In fact, if you look clearly in... uh, Verse 17 of Luke 12, this man is remembering his life. And this man is very much aware of what the Lord, and in, I'm sorry, that's the rich man. Look, at it's chapter yeah. 16. I'm sorry, it's chapter 16. Did I, did I put 12? That's yeah. 16. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, 1622. It had moved in my Bible from 12 to 16. In 16.22, it says he died and was buried. And verse 23, he's in pain after he dies. In verse 23, he can see things. After people die, they still feel pain and they can still see. They also, verse 24 says, can communicate. He, He cried out and talked to Abraham. And in verse 25, Abraham says, remember your lifetime. So after people die, they can still remember their lifetime. So in Luke 16, he also goes on to say in verse 26 that there is this big gulf between those who don't know the Lord and those who do know the Lord. And you know what's interesting? He recognizes Abraham that had lived about 2,000 years before this rich man had died. He recognized someone he'd never met that lived 2,100 years before him. But I'm not doing Luke, so I'm not going to do any more from Luke 16. Yesterday, there were 7.620 billion people on Earth. In a parable, everything is a kind of an illustration of something else. This one names individual people by name. So I would say that there are a group of people that want this to be just a parable, and they don't want it to be Jesus explaining the grave. But Luke 16, I believe, is the clearest explanation of what happens immediately after a person dies and what happened at the cross when Jesus finished the work on Calvary. Because if you really understand what Luke 16 says, before the cross of Christ, everyone that died went to the same place. It's called the grave or Hades. And there's a happy side, and that's where Abraham was. And there is a very sad side, and that's where the rich man went. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about this place. In Ezekiel, it's called the pit. Ezekiel says that people immediately go down to the pit, and they await judgment. 
Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, quoting the Psalms, that after Jesus died on the cross, that he went down and declared victory in this place called the pit. Because Peter tells us not only are unsaved people down there, there are angels that are in captivity in chains down there. And after the cross, Jesus took the believers like Abraham and all the other Old Testament saints and took them with him. Do you remember what he told the thief? To paradise. And it's interesting, the last verse of Hebrews chapter 11 says that Jesus had to die on the cross so that they, the people that had died before the cross, could experience what we experience this side of the cross. Do you see how it's so hard to teach Revelation because it connects to every other verse in the Bible? So to answer Larissa's question, yes, I believe that it's literally not a parable, but literally an account of Lottie's. two people that died. Because saved people no longer go to the grave, Hades, or the pit, this side of the cross, they immediately, when they're absent from the body, go to be with Christ. But since people are going every day, 161,876 every day, the majority of them are waking up in Luke 16. A place of darkness, a place of pain, a place of fire, a Should place of horror. Fire. You know, I love to do funerals. I've done hundreds of funerals. As a pastor, it's a wonderful place to share the gospel. In fact, when I used to serve in Russia, and, and uh, the Stubbs have seen this, the Russians love funerals. The believers take the casket of the saint that died, and they usually walk up and down every street in their little village, singing songs and carrying the casket. They take the longest road possible to the cemetery. And normal Greek Orthodox and normal unsaved Russians don't like to think about death and dying and funerals and caskets. And so as soon as one of the saints in the Russian churches die, they get them and start singing and marching around town. And everybody looks out their windows and they go, those crazy Christians. We are crazy. We believe that when we die, it's better than being here on earth. And the more you believe that, the more convincingly you can share the gospel. This is my favorite funeral message. Life is fragile. All it takes is a little hit on the head or a little bump in the wrong place or a crash, and it's gone. Death is inevitable. Everyone is going to die. And Christ is the only answer. Well, there's six truths. I want to show you my journal for just Revelation 6.1. Go back to your Bibles to Revelation 6. And in my Bible, there are 29 words in the first verse. Here are the first three words. Now I saw. That means that the events in Revelation are presented like one long chronological event. John is seeing things one after another happening. The second thing it says in verse 1 is, when the Lamb opened. That reminds me that Jesus is the central character of the whole book of Revelation. Then it says that Jesus opened one of the seals. This ties together chapter 6 with what we saw in chapter 5. God bases all of the tribulation judgments on the reality of his title deed as creator and owner of the universe held at his right hand. The next three words are a reminder John personally witnessed all these things. He says, I heard them. Then, the next truth is, one of the four living creatures said, with a voice like thunder. This emphasizes God's judgment always comes from his holiness. Do you remember the picture from Revelation 4, as you read it, of the throne of God? The throne of God is pictured in the Bible as the center of heaven, Flying in the air around the throne are these four living creatures. So this is the throne, and under it is the glassy sea, and up in the air are these four cherubim. And a cherubim is a living creature. 
And the Bible says these, const these creatures constantly say, holy, holy, holy. And one of those four that are flying around are the ones that say these judgments with a voice like thunder. Next, come and see. When John was told that, it means something. God wants us to know what he's planning to do, so he asked John to tell us. So just from the first verse, look at everything you can learn. Revelation is one long chronological event. Jesus is a central character, and God owns the universe. And John really saw all these things, and God's judgment is always tied to his holiness, and God wants us to know what he's planning to do. Now let's go to chapter 7. Chapter 7 is completely about the love of Jesus. And chapter 7 shows how much Jesus loves us. But then we get into this series of names about these tribes of Israel. Now look at Revelation 7 and verse 3. It says in verse 3 that the 144,000 are servants, and it says they are sealed. Now, there's a big Old Testament book, uh, Ezekiel, that many people don't read very often. In fact, how many of you think Ezekiel is your favorite book in the Bible? Come on. How many of you, it's your very most favorite book? Most people have hardly even read it. I've never seen anybody, it's their favorite book. It's my favorite book because all the books are my favorite books. Go back to Ezekiel if you can find it in chapter 9. Do you remember I told you that all the verses of the Bible are sitting with their weight on every individual verse of the Bible? When it says in the Bible that someone is marked by God, it's very interesting that Ezekiel explains what's going on. Now, we're in Revelation, not in the Old Testament, and we're studying Revelation, not Ezekiel. But Ezekiel was a priest. Ezekiel was taken off to Babylon. And Ezekiel, as a prisoner of war, is living in Babylon while Nebuchadnezzar is destroying Jerusalem. And Ezekiel sees the same events going on in heaven with these cherubim and the throne of God and all these Revelation events. But in chapter 9, he gives us an insight that I don't think is anywhere else in the Bible. And it says in verse 4, And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, throughout the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the forehead of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. The army of Nebuchadnezzar is outside the city of Jerusalem, and they have their spears, they have their bows and arrows, they have their swords, and they're coming in to kill and plunder and capture Jerusalem. And in verse 3, there's this man clothed with linen holding this writing table. This is an angel sent by God to go through Jerusalem. And in verse 4, this angel can look at individual people and can see whether or not they're believers in God or not believers. Do you remember in Acts 16 when Paul finds this demon-possessed girl, and she looks at Paul, and she said, you're a servant of the Most High God. Angels can see when the Spirit of God is inside of people. Demons are fallen angels. And when demons would come up in a crowd and all of a sudden see Jesus, they would start screaming because they knew who he was. This angel was allowed by God to look at each person in Jerusalem, and when he saw Boris, he said, Boris is a true believer. Why? Look at verse 4. True believers hate sin. If we're truly a temple of God and he lives within us, we don't want anything that defiles and, and is against God who lives within us. So every servant that is sealed is marked by God as belonging to him. Do you know why there were true believers that were looking for the Messiah that survived the Babylonian captivity? If you read the rest of Ezekiel 9, those that were marked by God, God protected from being killed by the Babylonians. Throughout the scriptures, this group is called the remnant. These are true believers that are protected by God 
so that the faith continues from generation to generation. That's who we bump into in Revelation chapter 7. Now go back to Revelation 7 out of Ezekiel. And as you look at that list on the board in front of you, knowing the Bible like most of you do, isn't there something wrong with that list of the 12 tribes? One of those 12 is not a son of Jacob. How many of you see it? Yeah, who is it? Say it out loud. Manasseh. How did Manasseh get in there? Who's missing? Ephraim. Who's missing? Dan. Dan isn't there. Why? Dan was a tribe that totally apostatized and began to worship idols. So God blessed Joseph and let Joseph have two of his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, as part of the promised tribes inhabiting the land. Did you notice the order isn't even correct of their birth order? Look in your Bible at verse 5, Revelation 7, 5. And it says, these are the ones that are sealed as God's servants, marked to go out and preach the gospel in the tribulation. The tribe of Judah, who was the fourth-born child. Then the tribe of Reuben, who was the first-born child. And then the tribe of Gad, who happens to be the seventh son born. I'm only telling you this, that God reordered the tribe. See, God has plans that are different than what most people understand. And these were the ones that parallel Ezekiel 9's sealed of Israel servants. And you see at the end of chapter 7 of Revelation, verse 3, it says that they have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Did you know that's just what Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 1? A seal doesn't mean he writes with ink on our head. It means that the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and kind of like this bottle is sealed, you notice that the water can't get out. That means that water that's outside can't get in. A seal prevents something from getting out or going in. Believers are sealed so that they don't lose the Spirit of God and their salvation. Okay. And also that the devil and his demons can't come inside. And the Holy Spirit seals us as servants. Once the Holy Spirit's inside of us, we then can respond and do the will of God as the Spirit empowers us. So that means we're secure, we're kept, we're protected. But look in Revelation 7 and verse 17. Even though the servants were sealed so they couldn't be killed, Jesus still comforted them. It says at the end of verse 17, he wipes away every tear from their eyes. Even though they were preaching the gospel, even though they were protected by God, these servants are walking through the world watching about half of all the humans being killed. You know, it's very hard to work in the world and to see all the sin and all the suffering and not feel it. That's why Jesus comforted them. And remember, I told you that the word comfort is para kaleo, to be called alongside. Notice it says in verse 17 that the lamb is in the midst of the throne and he comes to them and he stands with them and comforts his servants. Do you remember the prayer that I showed you the very first day of class? Jesus wants us to love him so much that we are comforted every time we spend time with him in his word. The one thing all the greatest servants of God have had in common is all of them were sustained in their ministry by a regular time meeting with God through his word. Now we're going to jump into chapter 8. Chapter 8 connects so many things that we see in the Old Testament to what Jesus is doing today. And chapter 8 also explains what God does with all of our prayers. And chapter 8 breaks into three parts. And the first part is God waiting. And what God is doing is giving time for people on earth to repent. And then Revelation talks about God is listening to the prayers of his people. And if this is the throne of God, right in front of it, there is a bowl where every prayer of every saint that's ever been prayed is being collected. 
But then Revelation 8 says that God responds to all those prayers and you better watch out. So look at the first two verses. Verse 1 of Revelation 8, when he, that's Jesus, opened the seventh seal. So we've watched seal 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now there's one left and Jesus opens the last seal. And the whole scroll is unrolled in front of him. And notice what it says. There was silence in heaven for a half an hour. Did you know we don't usually like silence? Your generation really doesn't like silence. I rarely see any young person that doesn't have one or two earbuds in. And if there aren't earbuds, they've got music playing somewhere within hearing distance which is very interesting because the Bible says that the characteristic of unsaved people is that they're restless. Unsaved people are constantly turned up inside. They're restless. They just, they just don't know what to do. They just are very, very anxious and restless. And you turn off the music and the internet and the games and it gets real quiet and they get very restless. God loves silence, God loves solitude, God loves quietness. His word says, be still and know that I am God. His word says, the effect of righteousness is quietness. So God lets it be quiet for a half hour to show his point. And then God starts unrolling the trumpet judgments. In Luke 21, 25, it says the sun is going to be darkened. In fact, in Matthew 24, it starts talking about all of the things that are going to happen in the sky with the sun and the moon and the stars. You know, it's real interesting. Every time the sun does anything funny, it affects us here on Earth. About a year and a half ago, there was a big solar storm on the sun, and it affected many European telephones, television, <coughs> even the Internet. In fact, uh, in 2017, just about seven months ago, there were seven days where the sun erupted. And this is a picture from one of the satellites. And what Jesus says is, during the time of the tribulation, it's not just a little solar storm here and there. It's like everything is going crazy in the sky. Here's another headline from a British newspaper. There was an asteroid named Florence that came the closest that any one of these things has ever come to the Earth. Here's the Earth, and here's the moon, and this thing came between in sight of the Earth. What will happen if one of these near-Earth objects gets too close and hits us? We'll look at verse 8. Now remember, John is standing watching events on Earth as a first-century man. And the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Verse 8, mm -hmm. chapter 8. And verse 9, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. And verse 10, a third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on the rivers and springs of water. The question is, as you read this, what did John just see happening. Well, the more that we study astronomy, the more we see that outside the Earth are all these objects that are floating around. Now, just to give you a little uh, dimension, airplanes fly about six miles above the surface of the Earth. And a daredevil skydiver went up to 24 miles high, jumped out, and glided back to Earth as a paraglider. And here's the International Space Station, 220 miles out. And there's one of those asteroids, how close it got to the Earth. They're all different ones out there that are all different sizes. And look how they've come between the moon and the Earth. In fact, the size of them, some of them that are very deadly, are only the size of one of our naval ships in the US Navy. And the more that our telescopes get advanced, the more they start counting how many of these things are constantly just flying around really close to us. Now, I've flown enough that I've seen a lot of the craters that you can fly over in different parts of the Earth where these things have hit. And one of those hit in Russia in 1908, 
and it destroyed everything for a hundred miles. It knocked down all the trees and it killed all the animals. When this event happens in the tribulation, death becomes inescapable for people on earth. And the book of Revelation was written to say, your only hope is Jesus. Okay, have a good break. See you afterward.